Whoa, I gotta paint these minis. We're gonna need a montage. Welcome to Goobertown Hobbies. My name is Brent, and in this episode, I'm gonna show you how I got these models ready in time for game day. I'll talk about my process for working efficiently, staying motivated, and finishing strong. This project was a lot of fun, and it was an opportunity to demo some new and useful techniques. Now, the first step in a painting project is deciding what your goals are. Are you going to be playing games with these models? Maybe you're thinking about playing in a tournament with a hobby score. Maybe you're painting them for display. Maybe you're trying to practice a new skill or test out a new hobby product. Maybe you're just painting for fun. Be thinking about what you want to do with these models, how much time you want to spend on them, and what painting techniques you want to use along the way. In this particular case, some friends and I decided to play in a Necromunda campaign down at our ancestral game store. By the time I cleared some other projects off my plate and got the models assembled, I realized that I had less than a week to paint them up. So, this project is about getting my Necromunda gang looking nice for the table. I had a Sunday and a few weeknights to spend on the actual painting. I knew I wanted to use some fun colors, I wanted to try using inks on infantry models, and I wanted to try putting nameplates on the base rims. On top of that, I wanted to film the process and make a video. So with those goals in mind, let's get to it. The first thing to do is to plan the paint scheme. The major feature of these models is a big trench coat, and their lore is that they're supposed to be sneaky assassin types. The box art has them wearing a lot of black with a few colored highlights. Nah, I have too much fun painting bright colors to make these dudes full goth. This is my gang. Picking a scheme that you're excited about is really important for staying focused and finishing a project. The other gangs in Necromunda get awesome neon colored mohawks. Well, my team is all bald, so they're getting some fun trench coats. I mean, the trench coats already have flak armor built into them. This is a delightfully silly concept, and that gives me free reign to paint them however I want. A bunch of sneaky, bald weirdos in brightly colored tactical trench coats. Exquisite. I think the color choice here is really important. Finding a great color combination can really elevate the overall appearance of your model, regardless of your skill level. For these models, I think the combination of green, yellow, and brown is awesome. The green in particular jumps right out off the table and really demands your attention. And yet, somehow that bright green avoids being garish. Somehow it looks correct as the color for the armored pleather trench coats that these weirdos are wearing. Anyway, from a technical painting point of view, this gang that I painted is nothing special, but that green does serious work. I really feel proud putting this gang down on the game table. In a previous video, I showed how I sometimes use Microsoft PowerPoint to play with color schemes. Seriously. In that video, I traced up the ganger who would eventually be named Hitman Travis. Just playing with color schemes, I chanced upon this green, and it got me thinking. Okay, on to some test models. I love me some test models. I tried putting two different green inks through my airbrush, and then started filling in some details. I ended up really liking this lime green. I kept painting and repainting some of the bits on these models until I found some accent colors which really worked with the green. In a previous batch painting video, I painted over 100 goblins. For that project, I did several test models all the way through to completion to really optimize the process. For this batch of just 15 Dalek, I was content with a couple of half-finished test models, just to nail down the basic colors. Let's keep moving here. I jotted down a step-by-step -step plan and I gathered all the supplies that I'd need. I'm lucky to have this table as a bit of a dedicated hobby space so I can spread everything out and keep cranking on a project. I've found that when I clean up a half-finished project and put it away after a hobby session, the chance of it staying tucked away and never getting finished are pretty high. Someday I'll show you my unfinished projects. If we're very lucky, maybe I'll even finish a few. Anyway. I've got all my stuff out and I'm ready to crank through to the end here. I'm starting with the model stuck on temporary bases so I can paint the bases separately. I've got less than a week to go until game day. You may notice that I really like my painting handles. These are wooden dowels with a magnet on each end. 
I magnetized my bases for convenient storage, so I might as well use that magnet for painting as well. The handles make it easy to work with the minis without dropping them or smudging things, and they give me better control. Something that I whipped up recently is this set of bleachers for my minis. This stand has little magnets to keep a bunch of my painting handles neatly organized. It should be useful for some fun time lapses of batch painting. Begin. For the first few steps, I use my airbrush. First, two thin coats of black primer, then a zenithal highlight using white ink from almost directly above the model. Then, two thin coats of the green ink. Finally, a quick coat of varnish to seal those thin layers. I've found that sometimes the inks dry to a hard, durable finish, and sometimes they're delicate. Better safe than sorry though, so it's a good idea to seal the model before switching to brushwork. Let's take a closer look at the airbrushing step. I'm doing the zenithal highlight with white ink from almost directly above the model. The trench coats have several prominent folds, and this zenithal prime does a great job of lighting up the top of the folds while keeping the undersides dark for some pretty nice lighting effects and color transitions. I'm using high pressure, a lot of air, and very little ink. Patience is key. I want the tiny quantities of ink to dry almost as soon as they hit the model. I find that if liquid starts building up on the model, then spider webbing can occur and really ruin the look. I built up the color with two thin, patient coats. If you're curious about my airbrush setup, I don't currently have access to a fume hood or a well-ventilated area. So I kick the cats out of the room, I wear a mask, and I turn on this portable HEPA filter. Nothing is too bad in acrylic paint, especially not the kind designed to be airbrushed, but better safe than sorry. I have a couple of Badger airbrushes here that I switch between. A Patriot 105 and a Chrome. Generally, I use the Chrome with its smaller nozzle for more precise work. I found that in my setup, a relatively high working pressure of about 30 psi gives a decent effect. Your mileage may vary. On to the brushwork. Some people have recommended that I give Vallejo's high opacity line a try. So here it is, a set of 16 extra opaque colors from Vallejo. Some of them are a bit muted, but there are some great colors in here. Presumably, there are a lot of similarities between this line and GW's base paints line. Except, of course, these Vallejo paints are a bit cheaper and they come in nicer bottles. Anyway, I used these paints whenever I could for this project. All paints are translucent to varying degrees, so when you're trying to work quickly, it's nice when one or two layers of paint gives nice coverage instead of three or four. I started the flesh bits with a base coat of that Vallejo Extra Opaque Heavy Skin Tone. I'll change that to a pinker shade in a bit, but it's a good base color. Then, I used Opaque Heavy Red on the breathing tubes. Next is Ochre on the armor plating on the trench coats. This is from the Vallejo Extra Opaque line, and it still took three coats to get decent coverage. On a test model, I tried GW's Averland Sunset, and I got a similar behavior. Yellow is just like that. Someday, someone will synthesize a better yellow pigment and make a lot of money. Next, I layered the skin tone with Elf Flesh from the normal Vallejo game color line. Then, I started hitting a ton of the metallic details with heavy charcoal gray. I have a fear of brush painting true metallic paints. I always seem to gum them up and make them look terrible. So, I avoid metallic paints and stick with grays whenever possible. Buckles, weapons, bionic bits. This gray ended up being my go-to miscellaneous technology color. In some ways, this color was a shortcut for me. There are so many bits of tech on these models, screens, buttons, lights, wires. I could have really gone to town on these things. Maybe I'll do that someday, but for now, we gotta get these models done. All those fun technology bits are gonna be charcoal gray. Next, brown for some pouches and holsters. Heavy Sienna. Vallejo Extra Opaque. Then, heavy blue-gray for the straps on the trench coat. This might actually be my favorite color in the Vallejo Opaque line. It has great coverage and goes on really smooth compared to a lot of other light gray colors. Nothing fancy, it just does its job very, very well. Then, I shaded the flesh with Reichland Flesh Shade from GW. That gets the skin looking nice. Next, Chaos Red from Army Painter on some of the weapon housings. 
Then I took a sponge to dab a bit of silver onto the weapons. That gives the impression of scratching and chipping and wear. I painted the eyes beige. I decided it was easier and creepier not to paint a pupil and just leave them as white orbs. These guys are weirdos after all. As these models are shaping up, I'm getting pumped to play Necromunda for the first time ever. I'm going to tell a little story to try to set the hype levels where they need to be. When I was growing up, the local community center put together camping trips during the summers. Hiking, biking, canoeing, that sort of thing. One of the counselors on these trips was a guy named Kevin. Kevin was probably only five years older than us, but he was a man. He was the man. Tall, strong, funny. He could build fires, repair bikes, and hike all day with a truly monstrous backpack. Kevin was just a wicked cool dude. At the time, my friends and I were 13 or 14 and had just gotten into Warhammer Fantasy Battles. One night at the campfire, we asked Kevin if he had ever played Warhammer. No, he said. He didn't play Warhammer. For a moment, our hearts fell. We had been judged uncool. Kevin had better things to do with his time than to play Warhammer. But then, a smile came across his face, and I'll never forget what he said next. A single word, spoken with precision and love. Necromunda. And so it was that I grew up understanding that Necromunda was the game that the cool kids played. Well now Necromunda is back, and I finally picked up some figures. My local gaming store has a Necromunda campaign, so it's time that I get these guys painted. Moving along here, let's get those bases done. First, brown primer, then a sponge to dapple on some red and orange. Then I sponged on some steel metallic paint to make the whole thing look like old rusty metal with just a bit gleaming through. Then a few dots of strong tone for oil spills. Finally, a wash of null oil over everything to nicely shade it. I think these bases look pretty cool. In a way, it's too bad that the long tactical trench coats will obscure the majority of the base. This rusty, dirty, metal paint scheme is similar to how Dirk at Dirk's Dystopia painted his own Mortalis board, and I think it's a great look for Necromunda games. These bases also fit in nicely with the Zone Mortalis boards that come with a Necromunda box set. Next up, I took my models off of their temporary bases and glued them to their new bases. Then it was time to add some nameplates. I started by painting a quarter of the base rim ochre. This naturally took several layers. I tried to paint exactly a quarter of the rim to represent the model's 90 degree vision arc. This is useful for gameplay, especially since many of the models have their shoulders squared in a different direction from where their head is looking. I figure that it's a nice courtesy to your opponents to mark the model's true facing in some way. Once the background color for the nameplate was in place, I hit the models with a gloss varnish. The gloss varnish is useful for some washing that I'm going to do, but it's also useful for applying decals. Okay, name decals. This is entirely new for me, but I tried out those printable decal sheets. First, I printed a test page to get the font size dialed in. Folded size 7 font seemed about right to me. Then I loaded the printer with decal paper and printed it out. After that, you're supposed to spray the decal sheet with varnish, so I did that with my airbrush. Then, just like any other decal, get the backing paper wet. I like this wet sponge method. After a minute or so, the backing paper will come right off. Next, carefully position the decal where you want it. I use Microset and Microsol to get decals to lay flat and look natural. By applying some Microset to the glossy base rim, the decal can be moved with just a light touch. This still takes a lot of care. As always, the decal plastic is fragile and prone to folding up in annoying ways. The black printer toner from my home printer is even more fragile, so I was very careful with the letters themselves. Sometimes a flake of toner, either a letter or a letter fragment, will detach from the decal and move on its own. I try to touch the actual letters as little as possible. Once the decal is drying in place, I finish the job with a light dab of Microsol. Later, when that's all dry, I'll seal everything with varnish, which will help hide the seam of the decal. 
Finally, I did an oil wash on some parts of the model. I started by taking oil paint and heavily diluting it with mineral spirits. Proper consistency is a matter of taste, but generally, as you slosh it around, the liquid should stay in the sides of the cup for a few seconds. I mixed up a brown and a black wash. When you apply it to the model, this stuff runs all over the place. The gloss varnish makes it extra runny, and the varnish also protects the layers of paint underneath. This wash really wanders around and seeks out the deep recesses. I like how it works on the armor plates and also around the edges of the jacket straps. Like any wash, you'll end up with some staining where you don't want it. A nice thing about these oil washes is that you can clean up the stains that you don't like even after they're dried. Just use a clean brush with a bit of mineral spirits. Okay, I am calling them ready for the tabletop and hitting them with a varnish. I used 50-50 matte and satin varnish through my airbrush. I didn't go full matte because I want the green pleather trench coats to have just a little bit of a sheen to them. So you may have noticed my naming scheme here. Adjective plus the name of a hobby podcaster or YouTuber. One of the best things about Necromunda is that you're supposed to care about every member of your gang. You're encouraged to root for them as they grow over the course of a campaign. There should be a bit of a personal connection there to your characters as they rack up kills or collect injuries and prosthetics. You're not just rooting for your side to win, you're rooting for each member of your gang. Picking a good name can really be a shortcut to connecting with your roster and getting that extra layer of enjoyment out of the game. For my team, both the adjectives and naming the character after an actual person give some personality to each of them, and then they can grow from there. So in addition to the batch of 15, I also fixed up the five test models to give myself a nice bench. Ten of the models are built exactly as they are in the Delac box, and the rest have some fun modifications. Luckily, I have a deep bits box and was able to give some special weapons to my friends Hot Carl, Big Justin, and Charming Adon. Nasty Blake got a las gun. Anyway, 13 of my 20 gangers actually made the roster. Robotic Ed ended up being my MVP. He was flaming people left and right with that hand flamer. One of these enemies caught on fire and fell into that pit, and the one next to him was able to put himself out before succumbing to his terrible burns. Robotic Ed does not mess around. Hitman Travis also got a kill. Now, I'm not saying that it was cool for him to shoot an enemy who was injured and crawling away, but then again, Hitman Travis doesn't mess around either. Nasty Blake was able to put down some nice cover fire with that last gun of his, but then he got shot and had to lay down for a little while. Like I said, picking some fun names can really add a lot to the game. It took a little over one hour to paint each of these gangers. This isn't super fast or super slow, but I think I did a nice efficient job here. I think the models look pretty good, and I'm happy that I got to practice some techniques that are relatively new to me. I'd never done nameplates before or used printed decals, but they weren't too hard to use and they do add a nice touch to the models. To fit this project into my schedule, I did skip a lot of details. In particular, all of the cybernetics and tech and weapons are still just charcoal gray. If I get really attached to this gang, I might spend some more time on these details someday. Maybe the faces too. Maybe. For now though, they're definitely playable. I got the models painted in time to play the game, and that deadline really helped me to power through. Grab that motivation wherever you can. I'm glad that I did get these minis ready in time, because Necromunda is really fun. I'll probably have to paint some more gangs one of these days. Well, that about does it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do me a favor, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Even better, tell somebody about this video or share it, that would really mean a lot to me. Alright, that does it for this time, thanks for tuning in.